So this is Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by Cyrus Pattinson, former GB rep and about to turn pro with Matchroom. How you doing? I'm very well, mate. I just uh, good, good to finally get on the way. Like it's been a long process, but it's uh, it's good to finally be sorting. It's the first time you've been on the channel, so if you don't mind, take us back to the very start. How did you first get into the sport, and, and how old were you? Uh, I was about 13, I think, when I started boxing, uh, and it was because I was uh, getting into trouble at school, so I was getting kicked out of school, uh, trouble with the police, uh, just needed a bit of direction, really, like, and, and uh, so I took that, really, like, I was playing football at the time, so I was trying to juggle both. But I excelled in boxing, like, and, and that's the one that I kind of stuck to. Did you plan to stay amateur for as long as you did from a young age? Or was there, a, you know, did you initially think you were going to turn pro younger? To be honest, mate, uh, when I was younger, all I wanted to do was win a time tease and we are North East ABA title. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, in 2015, when I uh, got all the way to the ABA finals, beating like top kids on the way, Scott Fitzgerald, Jack Rafferty and that, uh, got the finals, I had already like surpassed my expectations and the goals that I wanted. Uh, and then everything after that, I kind of had to ch change my goalposts a bit and and uh, ended up on JB, got a JB and then went from there. You went for the 2016 Olympics. You were eliminated in the quarterfinal of the European qualifier. You got two good wins before that. Um, but unfortunately, you couldn't go to the next qualifier because you'd already been eliminated. They gave someone else a chance. Why did you then continue on the GB squad rather than turn over them? Because you knew you'd have to wait at least another four years for the next Olympic cycle. Definitely. I mean, uh, when I because it was all a bit of a whirlwind anyway, like, when I got on late 2015, uh, I, I ended up on the podium within three months. Then I was getting sent, I got sent out of the box eye, beat Solomon Soto, a silver medal. So it all just kind of progressed really fast. And then I got selected to, to go to the European qualifiers, went to there, beat the large from Finland, beat uh, Ariat Marujan from Germany, world number three. And then I was eliminated by the Armenian. Uh, and then it was, I felt like I had like really been fast tracked that much. Uh, and I felt that to be honest, really, and I always say, I say now, like sometimes not getting what you want is a wonderful stroke of luck. Uh, cause I feel like if I had went to the 2016 Olympics, I definitely would have turned pro straight after. And in hindsight, uh, I'm nowhere near the fighter that I, I, I was. I am now uh, and I, I was a young boy I was very naive uh, about a lot of things my skills set wasn't as what it is now my mind my outlooks uh, so I felt like I had so much more to experience in the next four year cycle uh, I felt like I was already starting at a good entry point for the level I was at uh, and I just felt like I could had I had time on my hands and I had experienced the game, like, and I was in the best place for it, like, so. When did you get to a point where you started to think about turning over? Because we know that uh, Pat McCormack's obviously in pole position for that welterweight berth uh, at the next Olympics, uh, assuming he qualifies, of course. When did you kind of start to see the writing was on the wall in that sense and that you wouldn't be getting to the Olympics or at least not being sent to the qualifiers? Yeah, I felt, I felt... I mean, I was in pole position for, I think it was in 2016, 2017. And then obviously there was a turn in where Pat came up from uh, light well away from 64. Yeah, obviously I had all the, the accolades that he, he, we had previously from the way below. And then it was when he got selected to represent England at the Commonwealth Games uh, in 2018. Uh, I felt like, and then obviously from a win gold, which was expected anyway, uh, it felt like it was going to be a very hard task to shift Pat out that position. Uh, and then from then on, European Games, European Unions or whatever, that, everything else he's meddled at, if not won. So it kind of went from then next to, yeah, 
it was kind of in my mind. I thought I saw I need to plan in, start preparing, start talking, maybe start setting up, start putting the feelers out. Uh, and then I was ready in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously everything just went AWOL like so. Got everything for a reason in it. What, what is it about welterweights from the Northeast? I mean, there's, there's obviously Josh Kelly was your first rival on GB. Now the McCormack twins, obviously one well to one light well to yourself. Yeah. It's strange it's all from the same region. Obviously, you're from the same club as well, Bertley, as, as uh, the twins. No, no, we're, we're teammates. Like, so we've, uh, whoever gets sent to the competitions, the other ones are back home watching, sharing, supporting. Uh, and that's just the thing that what we're like. I mean, Frenchie and Luke were the same, same weight and they're all the same weight for a long time. I mean, it was me and Pat. Mark Dickinson was above all. Uh, so it was like we all just support each other and whoever gets to go it's, it's nothing personal obviously it's not your decision anyway we all want to go so it's just whoever gets picked goes and, and that's and that's been it but we've had some fantastic spawn sessions between all five of us you can imagine it says a lot as well about Graham Rutherford uh, um, Bertley and, and you're still going to be training under him as a pro as well no definitely and that's that's Partly what I had spoken to Matchroom about, I feel like uh, Graham has took us from grassroots all the way through to representing my country, to all, all the way around the world. He's made some fast, fantastic adjustments with it, with us. I've grew a lot under, under the guidance of him. And also he's a, the coach that I trust and I've got that relationship with the most, which I think is absolutely crucial in, in boxing, especially going into professional boxing having someone to look after your welfare and your health. Uh, I mean, there's too many people just jump strip and end up just putting that kind of in people's hands that they don't know nothing really about. So I think I think that was crucial for me in my decision. And he's your long-time trainer, of course, but tell us a little bit about how you linked up with your manager, Charlie Sims, and also promotion-wise, Eddie Hearn and Metro. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, Charlie, I think he's been around coming up in the JB setup since about 2015, maybe 2016. So in that time, I got a spar with Ricky Burns, uh, Connor, Connor, Connor Ben. I sparred with Ted Cheeseman. So all the lads that have came out of that gym that I've came up, I've sparred with. And that's where obviously we end up just talking, having having a good laugh and and obviously the relationships just grew from there. Uh, and then management-wise, I've I knew that there was a few options on the table, but I felt like seeing the kind of success that some of his other clients or people that work with him have had and the relationships that they have, that it's, it's not really, there's never really been often at all that uh, relationship has went sour or things have ended up in a bad way. From that side of thing, I felt it was more of a personal, more of an intimate kind of relationship mm. with someone rather than a big organization or a company. Uh, and he's Charlie's been there through it all, through my whole journey since the start. And to be honest, when it came down to the decision, I didn't really think there was a better man that I could trust than, than Charlie Sims. So, and that's where that came about. Yeah, he's a really good guy, Charlie. Um, how did you then go on to? Signed a promotional agreement with Metro. Uh, basically, I just left it all in Charlie's hands. To be honest, I mean, I was approached from uh, MTK. I was approached from Frank and Francis Warren. Uh, and Charlie had also said that there was a, an offer on the table from Eddie as well. Uh, and I just felt like we had, we, we had a few discussions, me and Charlie back and forth. And we just felt for my goals and for me wanting to go forward and stuff, I felt that Matchroom had always kind of been the one that was that I had my eyes set on anyway. To be, to be honest, to, to say this as well, like, and I think it was 2018, probably around the year that Pat went to the Commonwealth, I had like one of my lowest years in my, in my career, in my life as well. There was a few various things that happened and I had actually created a, a welcome to the team uh, image for matchroom and with my with myself and stuff on, trying to try and <laughs> keep myself motivated and and 
put some positivity back in my career and my life and it's came to fruition like which is a bit of a mad thing like so how, how similar was the one you created to the one that actually appeared in the press release to be honest because the, the ones at the time they didn't have like gold backdrop uh, they had like uh, they had like I, I don't know if it was black and white it was the black and white version obviously I had Sky Sports the zone match room uh, but it'll be on it'll be online somewhere it'll come up <laughs> eventually and I'm sure I've got a screenshot of the day I created it as well like so it's just a bit of a law of attraction isn't it <laughs> yeah it certainly sounds that way um talking of uh, Sky Sports and the zone I'm sure you were aware when you made your final decision about who to go with that uh, the Sky Sports relationship was coming to an end and that the yeah. UK fighters would be going over to the zone did that concern yeah. you at all, not having that Sky Sports platform as part of the package? Uh, it did concern us slightly. I mean, Sky Sports, even though it's just British, it's, it's like a heritage and kind of like the, the whole thing of just being involved for the British public and stuff. So that was that was always like a big bargaining chip for, for me or for going with Matchroom. So when I heard that Matchroom... Will be parting ways with Sky and going into zone. Uh, obviously, I, I, talk, I talked to Charlie quite a bit about it, and it makes sense that the zone is going to be worldwide, not just Brit- British. It's going to be you're going to have worldwide publicity, be better purses. He said, uh, and also that Matchroom have still got the box office slots with mm. Sky, so it seems like. It's, I'm not really going to be losing much from it, but I'm, I'm going to be gaining a lot anyway. And I, I think as well, from management perspective, I think if manager and promoter do the job correctly, that I'll, I'll be exposed to the British in a lot of different ways as well. So it's not just going to be a smaller niche, it's going to be a wider spectrum. Yeah, it makes sense. And given your um, age and your pedigree from all those international competitions, do you feel you can be fast tracked as a pro? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we we were offered slightly different uh, opportunities to start with, like a four rounder, maybe it's fight a journeyman, and me, Graham, Charlie, have all stepped up the mark and says, "No, we want a six rounder. We want to fight a, 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 a lively opponent where winning right road." I think we've found an opponent with six, one, four, stop two. Uh, so, and that, I think that speaks for itself. So, Yeah, well, the only way is up from there. So you won't be able to go back now. <laughs> <laughs> nah, definitely. Nah, that's what I'm prepared for. I mean, I was spoiled a lot of rounds in Berkeley anyway, 10 rounders and stuff. And I've boxed, I've boxed three in the amateurs. I've boxed five in the WSBs. And I can do it, so... It didn't really make sense for us to step back to go and four rounders on a fight journeyman. I've been fighting top, top uh, boxers and for a long time. So, And how do you feel about the debut? It's obviously June 12th, but it's, it's in the Northeast, which is great. It's fans coming back for the first time um, to a matchroom show in a kind of bigger amount. And probably the last Sky show as well. So there's a lot of big things around it. People aren't going to forget uh, yeah. it. No, that's that's another thing where I feel like the stars have kind of aligned because, I mean, last year, to 2020, when we were, we were in talks, discussions and thoughts about going pro, it was about April, March. Uh, and then when it was getting closer to leaving JB or going pro, uh, obviously everything kind of kicked off with coronavirus. I was meant to, I had my eyes set on an April show in at the Metro Arena mm. to make my debut. So that all collapsed. I stayed with JB. Uh, fortunately, I still gained a lot of experience from JB from spawn, training facilities, financial reasons. But as well, towards the end of the year, when the, start, the shows started back up, they had mentions of, I think it was a Conor Ben undercard in April, the Joseph Parker Ch- Ch- uh, Chisora card. And these, I couldn't get my license in time. I couldn't get away from JB in time. So nothing kind of fell nothing kind of worked and then obviously as everything's came together Matchroom's popped one out the hat and says oh well by the way we've got a show in Newcastle in June Spectator's going to be back and that was like one of the first opportunities I was kind of provided that I would have been able to do so it's like we've went full circle but here we are 
And you're starting at Super Welter, but ultimately you want to compete for championships down at Welter 147, right? Yeah, I'm there uh, because I've, I've boxed for years at 69 anyway. So I'm making 69 from my pro, from my debut, 152, I think it is in pounds. Uh, and we'll just we'll just go from there. Like, I didn't want to just crash it just for title fights. Your body's got to adjust, you've got to adapt. Obviously, after my fight, I'll be in the gym from there so we can build further onto it. And it's about it's about obviously doing longer fights and being lighter and just seeing how your body adapts. I'm not going to die off later rounds. I'm not going to be as strong. And this is the things that will kind of give and take and see what's suited. But either way, if I go to well at weight or if I stay out of light middle, uh, I'm confident that everything will be sound anyway. Tell us a little bit about your life outside of the ring and the gym. You know, what, what do you get up to when you're not fighting? Have you got a, a family of your own yet? That kind of thing. Yeah, no family uh, of my own, but I've got a really close family. Uh, I've got a, a big older brother, Chavez Louis. He's called another <laughs> nice name. Uh, I'm close to my dad, my mom, my nana and grandma. We're really uh, more of an intimate family, like so we've got a close relationship with each other. Uh, when I'm not boxing, uh, I tend to just chill out. To, to be honest with you, I re- really don't get up I'm much. Like uh, I've played the guitar since I was about six years old, so uh, I'm into music. I used to DJ a lot, uh, and just getting out and about and see, seeing my mates and stuff, and and that's a, that's a really about it. <laughs> Cyrus Ramon, where where does that come from? Uh, Cyrus was a Persian emperor. So he's a Persian ruler, Cyrus the Great, uh, and Ramon. I think it's from the eighties punk band, the Ramones. Were your so, parents were big fans of them, or I'm not too sure how it happens really, because me, my mom's called Debbie and me, my dad's called Sean. So I don't know, how, I don't know how they got, I don't know how they got Chavez and Cyrus. Like maybe they always wish they could have like more exotic names themselves. I. Definitely, maybe, or maybe that's not my dad, that's not my mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's for a whole other interview. Um, Definitely, we let you Jerry go. Springer, we um, have someone on the channel for the first time. We always ask them to share their um, social media handles so people watching can find them online. So just just tell us what they are, please. It's a uh, sales Ramon for I think it's pretty much for everything from a Twitter sales Ramon, from my Instagram sales Ramon. Uh, and Facebook, I've got obviously my personal page, but I've got my page for for boxing, which is uh, I think it's you'll find out it's Cyrus Pattinson as well. Uh, so it's the easy. That's the thing about having an, quite an exotic name, and it? it's pretty. It's easier to find. Oh, well, there you go. Maybe they were thinking ahead. That's a way I try to separate us from the rest. There. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll do that once you um, have your debut. Really appreciate your time. Um, very best of luck on the 12th of June and hopefully we can catch up afterwards. You can tell us how you felt at your debut when. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time, Danny, and uh, nice to meet you finally.